You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 187, ETS, Conference Interviews, part one. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you doing in Rhode Island? <laughs> in Rhode Island, indeed. Pretty well, pretty well. Yeah. It's it's not as cold as the last time we were here. Yeah, I never thought I'd actually ever be in Rhode, Rhode Island. Island. So when I'm texting my <laughs> wife, I always end it in Rhode Island. I'm eating dinner in Rhode Island. Yeah. I'm has she gotten the message yet? She's got the yeah. Well, she replies <laughs> back, "How are you doing in Rhode, in Rhode Island. Island?" So, yeah. I'm actually enjoying the state. I never thought this would be a state that I'd made it would make it to, but here I am. Here you are in all your glory. Yep. <laughs> well, we had some great interviews lined up for this episode. Yeah, we have uh, four uh, four scholars that uh, agreed to spend some time with us. We have Hugh Ross. Uh, he's probably the most well known uh, from Reasons to Believe. We're going to talk with Hugh about uh, his book, Improbable Planet, uh, and a few other things, again, that sort of you know, go with Hugh Ross. Uh, Doug Grothheis is next, and we want to talk to him about his thoughts on anti-intellectualism in the church, and that's something, again, that's sort of in the wheelhouse for our audience. Then we are followed by Andy Nacelli. Uh, we interviewed Andy last year. Uh, this year, we're going to be talking about uh, a new book of his, No Easy Fix. It's about the higher life or the Keswick theology. If those things are new to you, well, you know, stay tuned. You'll find out what those things are. And then lastly, Dr. Maurice Robinson, who is the uh, world's chief defender of the Byzantine majority text. Uh, a long time ago, we did a, an episode on textual criticism. And, you know, you heard about the uh, Alexandrian text and reasoned eclecticism. Uh, Maurice represents the the other view, Byzantine majority text. And I think uh, people are going to be real interested in what he has to say too. Well, we're back at ETS again, and we have with us Dr. Hugh Ross. Uh, of course, this is going to be a familiar name to many listeners. Uh, glad to have some time with Hugh. He's very busy. He's much in demand, as you might realize. Uh, but as we jump into it, maybe somebody out there doesn't know who you are. <laughs> so let's start with a little bit of self-introduction and how you got to be doing what you're doing now. Well, I'm trained as an astronomer, mm -hmm. got my PhD at the University of Toronto and did research in quasars and galaxies at Caltech. Mm -hmm. And as while I was at Caltech, I got called into the ministry. So I've been on the pastoral staff of a church near Caltech for the past four decades. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of in both camps, theology and, and science. How did RTV get started, Reasons to Believe? Well, I was at Caltech, and uh, it was another Christian astronomer there said, Hugh, have you ever thought about sharing your Christian faith with someone who's not a scientist? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, tell me where I can find these non-scientists. He <laughs> says, walk off the Caltech campus. All right. I took them literally and just went up to strangers and started talking to them. How the book of nature uh, confirms the, the book of scripture and I was amazed at how quickly people responded and gave their lives to Christ. I mean, with the scientists, I knew I'm in for a two-year project before right. they give their lives to Christ. Right. But for people who don't have PhDs in the sciences, it can be much more rapid. Once they see that it's true, they're, they're willing to, to move to the next step. Now, uh, earlier at, uh, today, in fact, uh, at the conference, we talked to Doug Grothheis, and he read a paper here that essentially dealt with anti-intellectualism in the church. So do you, how are, do you run into that? I mean, do, do you, do you run into people that um, sort of would shy away from doing apologetics, kind of shy away from thinking too much about science and nature that we should just accept these things by faith? I mean, what, what do you do when you encounter that? I run into that a lot, especially yeah. in the Bible Belt. And it usually stems from the fact that you've got Christians who see science as the enemy of the Christian faith rather than the ally. So how I deal with it is basically show them it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Science is the best friend we have for persuading non-Christians that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God and that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Mm -hmm. And so once they realize that science is the friend and not the enemy, they're much more receptive. 
how much do you, uh, has your work sort of increased? Has it shifted a little bit? Um, have you changed tactically, I guess, uh, in the, in the wake of militant atheism? Um, well, has it affected anything you do at all? Uh, not really. I mean, we've always been engaging atheists, especially in the scientific community. Mm -hmm. And we engage them with a testable creation model, basically saying we have an explanation for the record of nature that we're convinced provides greater predictive success and a more comprehensive explanation mm -hmm. uh, than the non-theistic models. And I think one reason why Christians run into a lot of hostility, they're basically on the attack saying, here's why your model is wrong. And they're not really understanding how the scientific community works. Mm -hmm. They're going to hang on to their models, no matter how many flaws you point out in, a, in them, until you propose an alternative right. model. So we've always taken a positive approach. That when we engage scientists, we say, here is our model. We want you to critique it. Well, scientists love to critique everybody else's models. Sure. <laughs> so that's how we get to engage them. And they're surprised when they discover this isn't what we thought it was. Oh, that's great. Um, your most recent book, I don't, I don't know if it's your most recent book, it's the most recent one that I've looked at, uh, Improbable Planet. Uh, the, the feel it gave me was like a sort of a Christian version of Rare Earth, the one by Brownlee, and I can't remember the other author, but is, right. is that fair? Or, you know, how, how yeah, is it's it Brownlee and Ward that yeah, came over the yeah. book Rare Earth. What's different is that the book uh, Improbable Planet was born out of a year-long study I gave in our church on the creation texts in the Bible. We literally studied every single creation text and noted that every one of these texts links the doctrine of creation with a doctrine of redemption mm -hmm. and then actually taught how there are places in the Bible that declare that God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything which means that the Bible is implying that everything God creates is for the purpose of redemption. And that launched a three-year study on my part, mm -hmm. surveying the scientific literature to put that biblical implication to the test. And the book is basically the outgrowth of that three-year survey of the scientific literature where we conclude every event in the history of the universe, Earth, uh, the solar system, our galaxy, the history of verse life, and every component plays a role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings. And so I've been going on university campuses saying, we have a better way to advance science. Mm -hmm. Interpret science from a biblical redemptive perspective. You will make more scientific discoveries. Your publishing success will go up. Our understanding of the book of nature will increase. And it's a great way to engage these unbelieving scientists with a paradigm they've never really considered. And that's how we get conversations started with them, sure. because they quickly recognize, you know what, this perspective's got merit. Can you give us a couple of examples you know, from the, the scientific world that illustrate the point? Well, the book closes by looking at the fact that you can't have billions of people living on Earth at one time unless they're living during an ice age cycle. Mm -hmm. And that cycle is driven by variations in Earth's orbit. However, those variations will typically bring you enormous climate instability. And indeed, that's been the case throughout the entire ice age cycle, except the last 9,000 years. Mm -hmm. During the last 9,000 years, seven different orbital cycles have all come into sync to give us this unique period of extreme climate stability. And we now know, for example, that the Ice Age cycle couldn't happen unless you have five simultaneous, unprecedented tectonic events. And I would argue all of them are miraculous. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why? The sun's getting brighter and brighter. The sun has never been brighter than it is today in the history of life, and yet we got ice. For 90% of Earth's history, there's been no ice. But without that ice and without it cycling between 10% coverage and 23% coverage, you can't sustain billions of human beings. And without that unique 9,000 period of extreme climate stability, mm -hmm. you can't set most of the human race free from coming up with agricultural products to engage in science, engineering, technology, and develop the technology 
and the global communication where billions of people can hear the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, not in millions of years, Mm -hmm. but literally in just decades. Right. Now, do you get, because of the, uh, you brought up climate several times, do you get drawn in? Has has anyone reviewed the book um, and sort of tried to either pigeonhole you or take the discussion to, you know, the the whole global warming kind of thing? We get into that a lot. I've actually written two books on that subject. And our theme is that the book of Job tells us how to manage the planet for the benefit of all life and tells us that God has designed the earth so that we'll never face a choice between ethics and economics. And that's what's driving this uh, global uh, climate debate. One side says we have to stabilize the climate and we need to sacrifice the economy to do it. The other side is saying you can never enforce that. People will cheat. That's Mm -hmm. not going to work. Well, what will work is if you come up with solutions to stabilize the climate, that put more money in everybody's pockets. Mm -hmm. If people economically benefit at the same time they do what's best for the climate and life on on Earth, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we're basically saying the Bible anticipated this thousands of years ago. So do you you get drawn into um, camps, you know, climate denier versus, you know, affirmer of what XYZ scientific model says? I mean, do you, do you get drawn into that? or do We you... get drawn into the debates, okay. but what's different is we're Christian yeah. and we're not climate change deniers. Mm-hmm. We're saying, yes, we're at great risk for bringing about the conditions that existed throughout the mm-hmm. Ice Age cycle, except for the last 9,000 9, years. What's different is we're proposing solutions uh-huh. to stabilize the climate, keep the temperature where it needs to be, that actually benefit the economy rather than kill the economy. And we give several examples in our books of how we can do that. What I find remarkable is the solutions we propose are all in the oldest book of the Bible. The book of Job basically tells us how to go about it. And it's like, so I'm trying to communicate to the scientific community saying, rather than trying to persuade everybody to make a draconian economic sacrifice to do the right thing, how about if we pursue solutions that are economically beneficial for everybody? And I find interesting about the book of Job, it doesn't tell us to focus on temperature. It tells us to focus on changes in precipitation. And if we focus on those changes, it simultaneously takes care of the temperature problems. So, for example, because of human abuse, we have made the Sahara Desert 10 times bigger than it was during the days of the Roman Empire and the Gobi Desert four times bigger. There are ways we can shrink those two deserts back to where they were. And by shrinking them, we can now grow wheat in what used to be the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. That would provide food uh, for people that need the food. It would give them income and would soak up huge quantities of greenhouse gases. Everybody wins. But it's basically focused on maintain the planet the way that God gave it to us before we started abusing the planet. Do you, do you get any pushback from any, you know, any in the science community or in the, uh, you know, we'll just say religious community or wider evangelical community about that? Because some of these, I mean, this is just me now. I, <clears throat> it seems like people have sort of planted a sword in the ground. They have. You know, in, in, you know for, for whatever reason, and I'm sure the reasons that you're, there can be some variety there, but they've just sort of staked out a position and they've aligned themselves either for economic or political reasons with, you know, a particular perspective. Um, Do you get pushback? I do get pushback, but I push back to the pushback and saying the problem is you're only looking at a limited number of solutions. Mm -hmm. And God has designed the planet so that we're never put in that rock in a hard place position. Let's pursue solutions that are win-win, not Mm win-lose. And, you know, from a Christian perspective, we human beings are sinners. You're never going to get the whole human population agreeing to an economic sacrifice to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. The sin nature that the Bible speaks about means that won't work. And so we need to counter that. But that's what I find remarkable. There are solutions. And it tells me how wonderfully God designed the planet so that we're never caught between that economic rock 
and the ethical hard place. Mm-hmm. With uh, a title like Improbable Planet, and then uh, again some of the content as well. Let's let's shift a little bit and talk about. Uh, you and I spoke at the same conference years ago. It's over ten years ago now. The, the God Man and ET thing, right? And because you all you always sort of get drawn into the probability or improbability of extraterrestrial life. So I remember your presentation, and I agreed with it then, and I agree with it now. But for the sake of listeners, you know, what what are, what are your thoughts on probability there? You know, how unique. Well, is a lot situation? has happened since we were speaking at that conference. Mm-hmm. Today, we have discovered over 3,700 planets outside of our solar system. And when the first ones were being discovered 20 years ago, the anticipation in the astronomical community, Mm -hmm. these planets are going to be just like the planets in our solar system. Well, none of them are. (laughs) Not only have we not found a twin of the Earth, we haven't found a twin of Venus. We haven't found a twin of Jupiter or Uranus or Neptune. In fact, we're finding all kinds of planets that are very different from our planets, Mm -hmm. things that we call super-Earths and Mm mini-Neptunes. These are actually the most common planets we're discovering, and our solar system doesn't have any of them. Mm -hmm. And what we now realize is that the more we learn about extraplanetary systems, the more evidence we are uncovering that our solar system is unique. We're not finding any other system that has the capacity to sustain advanced life, that's actually led to the recognition of something we didn't know before. Every single planet in our solar system plays a role in making advanced life possible here on Earth. Mm-hmm. So Venus has to be exactly the way it is. Mars has to be the way it is. Every one of the planets must be exactly the way they are to make our existence possible here on Earth. Yeah, I, I just recently read something about Jupiter, how it shields us from a certain number of asteroid collisions right, potentially. Right. I'm sure that's not the only one, but it, in what I was reading, it was kind of the most obvious illustration just because of size. But, you know, I, I'm sure, again, the arrangement is what it is, and then that causes, you know, well, for issues example, with orbits and trajectories and all that. It's necessary that Jupiter be the most effective shield. Mm-hmm. So it's crucial that your biggest gas giant be the most massive and the closest to the sun. But it won't work if Jupiter has to do it all by itself. You need another gas giant smaller and more distant than two more that are smaller yet and more distant. And guess what? That's exactly what we have. But one of the things that impresses me, the eight planets we have in our solar system, we have no destructive mean motion resonances. Typically, when you get more than three planets, you're going to get destructive mean motion resonances. And what, what is that exactly? What that means is you're going to get planets orbiting in such a way that two or three will line up periodically and cause gravitational disturbances uh, to wash through the planetary system, which would disturb the orbit of a planet like Earth and make it a non-candidate for advanced life. Hmm. And of all the parameter space in our solar system, for mean motion resonances, that adds up to about 99%. We're in that 1% where it doesn't happen. Hmm. And actually, the moon itself plays a critical role in breaking up those mean motion resonances. So we actually need our moon uh, orbiting us with a certain mass in a certain way to make sure that doesn't happen. In fact, the fine-tuning is greater. We now realize that you actually have to start the solar system with five gas giants where one of them gets kicked out. If you don't start with five, you can't explain the Mars-Earth uh, orbital system. Do, has has that kicking out, uh, do you run into people who would use something like that to support like a catastrophist model, um, you know, like the old Velikovsky kind of thing? Um, well, it's not a planet coming towards the Earth. It's okay. a planet going Being away expelled. from the Earth. Okay. So it's the opposite of a catastrophe. Okay. And actually, there are two models one which says that the fifth gas giant was completely ejected, and one that says it was ejected to about 50 times the distance from the sun that Neptune is. And actually a group of astronomers are trying to determine if indeed that very distant gas giant planet exists. But either way, it explains our solar system configuration. You know, obviously this, you know, Everything you just said there isn't unique to you. The scientific community knows this. The, the ones who, again, are in the astronomy community, the astrophysics community. But you still have so many people. Um, I don't know if the right word is predisposed. 
to wanting there to be extraterrestrial life or believing that it is? Do you think something else is motivating that? Well, I would say from a non-theistic perspective, you have to believe that life is common in the universe. Mm -hmm. From a Christian perspective, you can have it either way. You can say God doesn't waste miracles, sure. so he only has done it here. Or God is so enjoying to create, he's done it many times. And so it wouldn't be a shock to me if we find life on another planet, but I would conclude it's there because God miraculously created it. But so far, everywhere we look, we see hostility. We have yet to find a galaxy that's sufficiently like ours to be a candidate for life. We've yet to find a star that's a candidate or a planet that's a candidate. I'm not saying we'll find one, but right. we've been looking hard for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. And everywhere we look, we see hostility. The only place that's favorable for advanced life is right here. Now, on the reverse, let's say, you know, 100 years from now, we still don't have any evidence of uh, life elsewhere. Do you think that's going to disturb maybe a community? I don't know if you'd want to use the word atheistic community, but something that community that really desperately wants to find something superior to us, again, advanced life forms of some other character, almost like a substitute theism. Well, what I am seeing is this, as we learn more about how the moon formed, mm -hmm. about this movement of the gas giant planets in our solar system, the unique features of our Milky Way galaxy and our star of the sun, the comments you see in the scientific literature, this is actually published in the British journal Nature, the more we learn about the history of the solar system, the more it's causing us philosophical disquiet. <laughs> and what they mean by that philosophical yeah. disquiet, we're not able to explain this from a naturalistic perspective. Right, right. And keep in mind the Bible told us in advance, the majority of humanity will reject the evidence for the creator God of the Bible, no matter how strong the evidence gets. Mm -hmm. But there will be a large majority that will accept. And that's something I'm personally seeing in the scientific community. There is a significant minority of research scientists are saying, you know what, I can't deny the evidence. Mm -hmm. This testifies of the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But this, for a majority, they're just saying, this is sure causing us a lot of philosophical disquiet. Right. Let's go back to the Christian orbit, pardon the pun. Um, you once told me that the only place you were ever be, have, that you have ever been picketed was at a church. Um, do you still have any of that going on? Do you find churches more broadly, denominationally, whatever, are more open to thinking about other models, including your own, or is it still kind of... We still same? see hostility at the church level, but it's nothing like it was 30 years ago. Okay. So as time goes by, we're seeing more and more openness, mainly because we've taken the approach with churches and pastors. There's a mission field out there to be reached, mm -hmm. and you're not going to reach scientists and doctors and dentists and lawyers and engineers mm -hmm. with an anti-science message and basically taking him back to the Belgic Confession, Article 2. God gave us two books. And so as I was speaking today at this conference, God gave us a book of nature to bring people to the book of Scripture and to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we're finding increasingly, even with pastors who have no training in science, they're appreciating that the book of nature, science in particular, can be a powerful tool mm -hmm. to bring unsaved people to faith in Jesus Christ. So as I engage pastors, I'm basically exhorting them, focus on the front door, not the back door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Focus more attention to who you can bring into the church than who might leave. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, how can people find out, of course, get and read Improbable Planet? Well, we have a website, reasons.org. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter page where I answer people's questions. They're welcome to engage me there. Mm -hmm. But all of our resources are available at the reasons.org. Okay. Okay, Trey. Earlier you referenced eight planets, so I take it you don't consider Pluto a planet then. <laughs> well, uh, plan Pluto got demoted. He did. The reason Pluto got demoted is when it was discovered we grossly overestimated its size. We now realize there are asteroids bigger than Pluto. So we keep Pluto on the list. We got to add about 30 more bodies. And so they either call it a dwarf planet or a non-planet. Right. And so now there's come a new term uh, where you get Plutoed. That means you've been demoted. <laughs> 
It's pretty good. All right. Well, thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. Well, we're here again at the Evangelical Theological Society annual meetings. This year, of course, we're in Providence, Rhode Island. And we have with us Professor Doug Grotheis. Uh, could you just start off by telling the audience a little bit about where you teach, you know, what your degrees in, what your specialties yes. are? I teach apologetics and ethics at Denver Seminary. I'm professor of philosophy. Been there since 1993. And I have a PhD from the University of Oregon in philosophy from 1993. Good. Well, we wanted to have uh, Doug on the program because he's given a I guess a couple papers, but one that really caught my eye was a paper about anti-intellectualism in the church. Right. So how would you define that? In other words, what, what prompted you to, mm -hmm. to propose that? Well, I teach apologetics at Denver Seminary, and I have for 25 years. And sadly, I have to make an apologetic for apologetics <laughs> at the very beginning. Right. So the thing that impedes or even can destroy apologetics is anti-intellectualism, which is the idea that faith and reason are completely separate mm -hmm. and that one ought not apply arguments and analysis to matters of theology, matters of the spiritual life. So over the years, I have talked about how the different aspects of theology, the topics of theology, all oppose anti-intellectualism in terms of doctrine of God, Christ, salvation, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I put that together in a paper that I'll be reading at the conference called um, Anti-Intellectualism and Systematic Theology. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a little more technical than what we want to do here. Sure. But this is a plague on the church because we're called to give a reason for the hope that we have when people ask us why we believe. And this is part of reverencing Christ as Lord and part of our sanctification is to think well uh, with unbelievers and mm -hmm. think well with believers. So it's a great concern that I have, and I've had it really uh, ever since I became a Christian back in 1976. Mm -hmm. I'm a thinking person. I'm a philosopher, and I need to engage my intellect for the cause of Christ. Uh, the first summer I was a Christian in 1976, I really didn't know what to do with my intellect. Mm -hmm. And I was around a number of Christians who were terrific evangelists, and they were learning about the Christian life, but they didn't have any theology of the intellect, So, or what they had was bad, I right. should say. <laughs> so my first summer was very frustrating because I still had all these questions about Christianity. I had converted out of a background of atheism and some mysticism, but I didn't know what to do with them except read the Bible, pray, speak in tongues, witness to people. Right. But in the fall of 76, I discovered Francis Schaeffer's book, The God Who Is There, which I've now probably read 10 or 12 times. And he gave me a charter for developing a Christian mind so that I didn't have to be afraid of the great matters of controversy and the perennial questions of the ages. And that's what I've tried to do ever since is know what I believe and why and take that to as many people as I can. What kind of pushback uh, do you get, or I could ask it this way, what do you think causes this sort of, it's almost, it, it almost becomes a point of spirituality to mm -hmm. you know, oppose this kind of thing. So what, why are people taught this? What, and yeah. you know, what kind of pushback do you get? Well, there's several reasons. One is a bad reading of Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, Paul talks about God making foolish the wisdom of this world in 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians. And people think that means that God is against sound reasoning or critical thinking. And I think if you look at that carefully, what he's saying is that the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. It's not that the cross or the Christian message doesn't cohere logically. It's that it's an offense to our pride. Sure. And you can't just start out from human philosophy and somehow in six steps get to the cross. It's a revelation from God. It's not based on human reasoning, but that doesn't mean that it is hostile to human reasoning. Mm -hmm. So there's that selection of texts. And then also sometimes people take sec uh, Colossians 2, 8 out of context, which says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy rather than on Christ. And they take that to mean all philosophy. And it says hollow and deceptive philosophy, 
which was a kind of probably early or proto-Gnosticism that Paul was dealing with. And then when you go to Paul's ministry himself, he's always having dialogue, reasoning with people, with Jews, with God-fearers, sure. and with philosophers in Acts 17. Uh, all Christian philosophers love Acts 17 because Paul is dealing with the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers on their own ground, literally, in the Areopagus, and also topically. He's arguing philosophically, and he's exposing the fallacies of their own philosophy. Why do you think that that's so, that's so difficult, other than just bad exegesis of those two passages? Do you think, well, do you think the church is sort of reflexively teaching its people to, to stay away from competing ideas? Yeah, I think sometimes. I think part of it may be a lack of courage mm-hmm. and confidence that if we retreat into our realm of faith, which is private and subjective, then we don't have to outthink the world for Christ. We mm-hmm. preach... Uh, We give, we try to lead a moral life and follow Christ, but this area of engaging the world with Christianity is absent from a lot of settings. Now, there's been a resurgence of interest in apologetics in the last 10, 20 years, and also in Christian philosophy going back even 30, 35 years, and I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a movement toward the reinvigoration of the intellect, but... Still, some churches will not preach apologetics. Uh, They won't really support people who want to go into philosophy or one of the humanities. And that needs to change. Now, this will sound like maybe these two things are related. Maybe they're not. But do you think this attitude has both contributed to militant atheism Mm -hmm. and also because of militant atheism, that's why we're seeing a resurgence in apologetics. Do you see a circle there, or are there yes. different points? Well, um, Pascal said in the Ponsais, atheism shows a strength of mind, but only to a certain extent. And what he meant was, I think, that in his day, to be an atheist meant you were different and you had to give arguments. Mm-hmm. You had to support it. And I think today the, the new atheists are giving arguments, and they are very militant about it. And part of their fuel is the Christians who say, I just believe, and I know the Bible's true in my heart. So they're easy targets for any kind of a philosophical atheist, but the responses to the new atheism have been very powerful, and I think you're right. It's a good point that it's sparked more apologetic engagement because you have a Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins on television selling tons of books, Sure, and they don't pull any punches. They don't say, well, Christianity has some good points, but we think atheism is a little bit better. They're saying things like Christianity is utterly irrational. Faith is opposed to reason. Mm -hmm. And Dawkins has even said, I don't think religious people should be allowed to raise, uh, to to educate their own children. Mm -hmm. He's made very inflammatory statements like that. Uh, But we've always had a need for apologetics. Anytime someone says, I don't believe because it's irrational or I don't believe because it makes no sense, then we should engage that person lovingly and thoughtfully. What what would be some of your recommendations for, um, you know, specifically responses to the new atheism, either by Christians or I'm trying to Berlinsky, I I guess he's a a Jewish fellow. Right. Somebody like that, you know, Mm -hmm. who's sort of thrown their hat in and defended at least theism. Mm hmm. What would you recommend? Well, there's so many responses to atheism proper and to the new atheism. Uh, it's blow my own horn. I've got about 200 pages of natural theology in my book, Christian Apologetics. But you mentioned Berlinski, who is a Jewish agnostic. He wrote a book several years ago called The Devil's Delusion. Mm-hmm. And he gives very strong arguments against atheism and yeah. for intelligent design. So, yeah, I really like yeah, the book. I do, too. He's quite a character. I met him uh, and he's, he's very uh, urbane and witty when you hear him being interviewed or you see him on a video. I encourage people to do that. He doesn't seem to like Sam Harris very much. No. <laughs> no, I think the more knowledgeable and balanced agnostics and atheists realize that there's more heat than light in Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. Mm-hmm. Uh, Terry Eagleton wrote a book criti- criticizing Hawkins and Harris and Terry Eagleton's a Marxist atheist, but he mm-hmm. said they don't even get Christianity right, mm-hmm. and they're not 
duly respectful towards the tradition. Yeah. Well, oh, that's good. Well, you know, we, uh, we're glad you could spend a few minutes with us. And uh, again, for our audience, our audience runs into anti-intellectualism a lot. They, you know, we, I get a lot of email. We get a lot of interaction mm-hmm. with people who I had this question in church yeah. and I got shut down. I was right. told to, you know, don't don't think too much about this. That's just, dangerous. Just have faith. Right. That sort of thing. Yeah. So you know, I wanted to have a, a you know, well-known and certainly, you know, you're in your publishing, you're not only publishing, you know, for your students, you know, and peer, under peer review, but you're trying to produce some material for the average person. You know, oh, definitely. It. Definitely. And also, I think one of the best books you could read on this would be my friend J.P. Moreland's book, Love Your God With All Your Mind. Mm-hmm. It's now okay. out in a second edition. Tremendous developing a theology of the intellect and then how to think critically, how to engage in apologetics, how to create a culture of learning in your church, which we often lack, sadly. Have, have you read any of the books associated with kind of reinventing the scholar-pastor role yet? You think of the book, uh, The Pastor Theologian? Yeah. I've read parts of those, and I support the idea. Mm-hmm. Um, a pastor should be a thinker and should be a public intellectual for the cause of Christ. And I, we shouldn't separate scholarship and the pastorate. Um, Augustine was a pastor. Lutheran, or rather, uh, um, Calvin was a pastor. Jonathan Edwards was a pastor. And theology is is really for the church. And then the church goes out into the world and defends it. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, we're back at uh, ETS, and we're with Andy Nacelli. Uh Some of you might recall that we interviewed Andy last year. And for those who didn't hear that, we're going to ask him to introduce himself again, uh, give us a little self-introduction, who you are, where you teach, what your degree's in, you know, what you teach, that sort of thing. My name is Andy Nacelli, and I am Associate Professor of New Testament and Theology at Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis, and I'm one of the elders of Bethlehem Baptist Church, so we're a church-based school. Some people might know the name John Piper. So he was the pastor of our church for over 30 years, and he's a chancellor of our school. And it's a delight to, to be a pastor in that church while uh, shepherding students. And I teach New Testament theology and ethics. And I just love, love, love what I get to do. It's, it's a dream. So I teach, research, write, shepherd. Uh, I love it. What's your academic background? Yeah, I, uh, I went to a Bible college and then to Bob Jones University for a, an MA in Bible and a PhD in theology. And then I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the Chicago area for a, another PhD. And that one is in New Testament exegesis and theology. And I did that one with, with D.A. Carson. Mm-hmm. So I worked for Don for almost 10 years as his assistant. And uh, it's kind of like uh, getting to clerk for a, like a Supreme Court justice, <laughs> like for a New Testament guy is pretty right, cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. Well, you have a new book. So tell us about that. So the the latest one is called No Quick Fix, and it's it's a book about higher life theology. So I try to explain the history behind it, just tell the story of it, and then explain what it is, and then I evaluate it. Well, let, let's start with what it is, and then mm-hmm. you can get into a little history. But so yeah, for someone like what in the world's higher life theology? has different names. Some call it let go and let God theology or Keswick theology. So the the basic idea is that in the Christian life, there are different stages of Christians. So in the comic world, think you got Clark Kent and Superman. There's like the normal average, you know, failing Christian. And then there's the above average you know, succeeding, successful, victorious Christian. Uh, some call it the higher life or the deeper life or the abundant life or the you know, the second blessing. There are all kinds of different terms for it. But the, the, the key issue is that there are two distinct kind of Christians and you can experience something that elevates you from stage one to stage two. Now, does this drift over into, you know, the, the old charismatic baptism of the Holy Spirit kind of thing, or is it different? Right. Okay, so the Pentecostalism I, I, has a view of this stage one, stage two as well, 
And for them, the key to moving between those is a baptism of the Spirit. Some say it results in speaking in tongues or something like that. So, yes, it's similar, but not the same thing. Same thing, Wesleyanism has a two-stage approach where the stage two is entire perfection or Christian perfection. Uh, There's another similar version uh, that Dallas Theological Seminary in its early days taught. Um, Lewis Perry Chafer was a theologian. Uh, He was one of the co-founders of Dallas Seminary, where the, the stage one is that you're a carnal Christian, and stage two is your spirit filled, and that the what moves you from stage one to stage two is experiencing a crisis of dedication. You dedicate your life or rededicate your life, and then you experience uh, stage two. So Keswick theology or higher life theology says that what moves you from stage one to stage two is a crisis of consecration, which equals letting go and letting God. So it's 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 kind of this passive. It's not me, and just trusting Jesus to do it all, and then boom, you 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 enter the stage two. Is this some sort of, you know, when when I hear let go, let God, you know, let Jesus do everything, I, I naturally wonder, well, where does that fit into obedience and sanctification? How is it? How is it? Or is it similar to something you like you read about in the East, where you have these sort of meditative plateaus? Um, you know, where does this fit in both a Christian and a non-Christian sort of approach to spiritual experience? The, the phrase like go and let God is so plastic and it's so it can mean so many different things to different people. So what Keswick theology meant was a very specific. So that's, that's good you point that out. I like the phrase that J.I. Packer uh, recommends, trust God and get going. Uh, <laughs> it's so yeah, we want to, we want to be trusting God absolutely, faith in Jesus, yes, 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 and actively pursue that that growth. There's no passivity about it. What's the history, you know, behind this? Yeah, the the father of these movements that distinguish between these stage one, stage two Christians is John Wesley, okay. and and then that moved on to other people within Wesleyanism. And then there are different branches after that. There's uh, Charles Finney and Asa Mahan are one branch, and there are other versions of Christian perfection that it's kind of coalesced into the Keswick movement in 1875. Um, Someone named Hannah Whittle Smith and her husband, Robert Purcell Smith, were kind of precursors to the Keswick movement. But 1875 is when it all came together. Keswick, it's it's spelled K-E-S-W-I-C-K. The W is silent. It's a place in the northwest part of England where they had their first convention, and it became known as the Keswick Convention. And that first generation went until about 1920. That encapsulates the higher life theology I'm talking about. Later on in the Keswick Convention's history, it changed its views and became more reformed in its, in its views, such that I, I'm going to, God willing, be in England for the first half of next year. And the director of Keswick invited me to speak there in july <laughs> wow knowing what yeah. i've written sure i, I declined because i'm coming back in june but uh that would have been cool uh, yeah really yeah. so well, let's talk a little bit evaluatively yeah. um in your book how do you assess this whole thing and, and how other than you know sort of a in, a in a wesleyan context if it even is used anymore in a wesleyan context but where do you see this kind of thinking so how do you evaluate it and then Who's sort of representative of this now or something like it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually pretty common right now in certain circles of evangelicalism and, and a subset of evangelicalism is fundamentalism. Uh, that was part of my background, and it was, it was very common there. Um, evaluating it, uh, I think in my book I give 10 critiques, which I preface with genuinely saying i'm thankful for many good things about the people in this movement who loved god wanted to be holy want you know so there's so many good things about the people involved names that people would know like hudson taylor and andrew murray sure uh hcg mool etc so when i critique it that there's really one fundamental critique and everything else is secondary the main critique is that this view of higher life theology separates justification from progressive sanctification when i think that those are those two concepts are indissolubly connected you can't separate them if you if you've genuinely experienced justification then god will be progressively sanctifying you 
we can't we can't disconnect those we can't disjoin those and that's essentially what right. this does so, so you wouldn't you wouldn't have someone who you know has genuinely embraced the gospel uh there's your justification you know element you it wouldn't be normative to have that person like not progress is that what you're saying it, yeah so that that should be sort of this organic process that that every every christian you know should be experiencing and you're saying that this idea kind of would let there be a category of non-progression that all of a sudden it hits or is, yes. is that what you're getting at i'm saying with the reformers that the same faith that justifies a person mm-hmm. is the same faith that progressively sanctifies that transforms that person there's no category in the new testament for someone who is a christian who bears absolutely no fruit and is permanently carnal mm-hmm. That's that's what I'm I'm disagreeing with, and that's what higher life theology has a category for. Right, right. Yeah, that that would be allowed to exist within the system. Right, right. Yeah. So, how do you in your book? How do you sort of get at that? What are some key key passages? Yep. You know, the, how, the key passage is Romans six, okay. which argues that a non-Christian is under sin's tyranny, but after becoming a Christian, we're no longer slaves of sin we don't have to serve sin anymore that's the whole point of, of Romans 6 is saying sin is no longer your master you have another master righteousness jesus and you are not to serve sin anymore you're not a slave to sin the way high life theology frames it makes it sound like you could be a slave to sin mm-hmm. so there are other passages i, I work through like first corinthians 2 and 3 talking about the carnal spiritual christian and and uh, Ephesians 5.18, what does it mean to be filled by the Spirit? John 15, abide in Christ, what do those mean? And I argue uh, in those passages that none of them have a category for a permanently carnal Christian that is fleshly in every every way. Everyone is fleshly in some ways, and we're, we're God is sanctifying us out of those, uh, never sinlessly till glorification. And with Ephesians 5.18, be filled by the Spirit, and John 15, abide in Christ, I'd argue that those are saying that you can progressively increase in how you obey those commands. I think every Christian is filled by the Spirit to some degree. Every Christian abides in Christ to some degree. I don't think those are mystical categories that, oh yeah, an elite number of Christians obey and everyone else doesn't do it. Mm-hmm. Now you've used the word mystical mm-hmm. and mysticism a couple of times. Is this where you see, um, other than in fundamentalism, which is, again, like a, a small sector of believing Christianity. Do you think this sort of idea has influence in, uh, you know, we we could say Christian mysticism, but uh, like a common pejorative would be uh, like evangelical Gnosticism. I mean, you you see these sorts of phrases on the internet uh, in, in both sort of descriptions of, Hey, here's who we are. And also critiques of some, group or some movement or some person or some book or some idea. So, how, you know, give us a, is there a more popular, you know, something wider than the fundamentalist context, somebody that we would sort of have heard of, or maybe a book or something like that, that you either suspect or you really believe is sort of caught up in this idea and perpetuating it? Well, now you're testing my pop cultural knowledge, <laughs> which is very low, very sparse. And uh, I have friends and acquaintances and people I don't know ask me all the time this, this question of, you know, is, is this person Keswick? Is this person Keswick? Yeah. And my answer is I, there's so many pop people teaching today, uh, writing pop level books, and that I'm just not familiar enough to say, yeah, here's a, per- a perfect example. But the, the basic gist, it's present all over the place. Yeah. Let, let, let's approach it a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, would there be... Um, sort of famous teachers or preachers that would um, let the category of you know, here's a Christian, they never grow, they never show any fruit. They let that category exist. And then they have a second you know, category. Yeah. So are you familiar with uh, the Lordship Salvation debate that happened in the yeah, 80s, yeah, 90s? Yeah, it feels old, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the people advocating for what they called non-Lordship Salvation would fit in into what I'm disagreeing with. Okay. I don't like the term lordship salvation, but yeah. the idea is when you become a Christian, Jesus is your savior and your master. 
doesn't mean you obey him perfectly, but he's right. your master. You can't have one without the other. Right. So people like Charles Ryrie, St. Hodges, the Dallas mm-hmm. Seminary at the time, were arguing for this view that you can have Jesus as your savior, but not as your master, that you yeah. can be a fruitless Christian, mm-hmm. a permanently carnal yeah. Christian. Like you could be someone who's a dropout of school and yet still make it. It's, yeah. It, yeah. I'm trying to remember that who's, who's the guy here at ETS that's sort of known for this now Wilkin. Yes. That's the grace yeah. evangelical yeah. theological society. Okay. And that's exactly what they argue. Okay. Right. Non lordship salvation. All right. So let, can you can you talk just about that society or that movement just a little bit more before we wrap up? Because somebody in the audience may not have heard of that, or no. maybe they have. But so their basic take is is a two step view of the Christian life, which means there's a permanently carnal there's a category for a permanently carnal Christian, someone who is bearing no fruit, and they argue essentially what. Lewis Berry Chafer argued, and then take that a step further, uh, such that even people like Charles Ryrie wouldn't align up with them in every every degree. Mm-hmm. So, I could give an example um, on the issue of repentance. That group is well known for saying this: the Greek word for repentance is metanoia or metanoia, and they would argue that that word, uh, the the etymology of that word, is change of mind, and they'd say it means change of mind. And only the mind, nothing else. That the word means you just simply change your mind about who Jesus is factually. Mm -hmm. Who was he? And once you agree, you assent in your mind to those facts, that's sufficient for repentance of its change of mind. And I would argue, along with most theologians throughout church history, that repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. Mm -hmm. It is a turn 180 of you're on your way to hell in your sin and you turn from your sin to Jesus. It's an actual turning from sin. It's not simply a change of your mind intellectually about who Jesus is. Yeah, That's when I think yeah, that. It's a, it, it's a much wider net. Yeah. You know, than, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we hope that the uh, the book does well. It's by Alexum Press. So what's the title again, just to remind everybody? No Quick Fix. Okay. No Quick Fix by Andy Nacelli. Thanks uh, for spending some time with us again this year. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Well, we're back at ETS, and we have a special guest with us. We have Dr. Maurice Robinson uh, here to share some time with us. And I'm going to let Dr. Robinson introduce himself, where, you know, where your degree is from, what you spent your career doing, and then we'll just use that as a springboard. Okay. Well, I'm glad to be here and able to do the podcast. And as far as where my degree is from, I, my terminal degree was at Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, mm-hmm. and I, my major area was in New Testament textual criticism, and I did my doctoral dissertation on the singular readings in Greek manuscripts uh, of the book of Revelation. Oh, wow. So that's part of my background. Otherwise, I, um, I can tell you a little bit about my own background. I'm actually sure. a Yankee. I was born in Massachusetts, <laughs> but grew up in Florida. Okay. <laughs> so you're sort of home. My relatives, I still have okay. relatives up in Massachusetts. So, Well, you, Dr. Robinson, uh, you're known very widely uh, in the academic community and even broader than that for probably being the chief voice uh, defending a Byzantine majority uh, text. So if you could, again, explain what that means uh, and why your work is different than maybe other textual critics. Well, there's a lot of complicated things that could be talked about, but to keep it really simple, the current so-called critical texts, which are usually the Nessel Island text or the United Bible Society's text, which tend to be used as the textbooks in Bible colleges and seminaries, Mm -hmm tend to be based on what is called reasoned eclecticism, and they have a preference to follow the earliest manuscripts only because the presumption is that the earlier the manuscript, the closer the text is to the autograph, and therefore the better the text. Mm -hmm. And And those are the Alexandrian. Right. That is primarily the Alexandrian text, although... There's another text called the Western text, Mm -hmm. which is also equally early with the Alexandrian, but it is not usually favored because it has so many 
wild and crazy readings. <laughs> I favor the Byzantine text, which really doesn't show up until later manuscripts, but the problem is that if you go to the church fathers of the fourth century, you will find the Byzantine text being used by them, and this would include Chrysostom, it would be Basil of Caesarea, and you have later, you'd have Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory Nazianzus, and they're all using the Byzantine text without even a hint that that might have been a new development. Mm -hmm. So they are apparently using a text that was already well known prior to the fourth century. And there are other reasons, they're a little bit complicated, mm -hmm. but there are other reasons for preferring the text found in the later manuscripts in view of that early patristic support and also in the terms of the localization of texts. Mm -hmm. The Alexandrian right. text comes primarily from the Egyptian region, mm -hmm. if we could allow any geographical assignment to that because of where the papyri was sure. found. Yeah. Can you put a number on that? Like how many Byzantine majority readings show up in the church fathers of the 4th or 5th centuries? Has anybody counted that? I can't put the number on it because I, I don't work with the church fathers, okay. but John Bergen cataloged all of the biblical quotations in the church fathers in the first five or six centuries, and he came up with over 86,000 quotations, and of those, he said the Byzantine text was being quoted in a three to two proportion, which means about 60% of their readings were quoting the Byzantine text, whereas 40% of their readings were mm -hmm. quoting either the Alexandrian, Western, or just some independent else, variety yeah. of texts. Well, that, that's really interesting. Because my field is Semitics and Old Testament. And, you know, you have this, none of, the, none of the texts, for lack of a better term, families or types. You've got Samaritan Pentateuch, what it was underneath the, the Septuagint. You've got the majority text, but they all hit the same chronological wall because of Qumran. And it sounds like that's sort of the same situation. Well, the Byzantine text, hits that wall as term, in terms of our actual Greek manuscripts. Mm -hmm. We have only a very few Greek manuscripts that actually date from before the 4th century, mm -hmm. and they're all papyri, papyri and yeah. almost all of them are very highly fragmented. Mm -hmm. And the most complete ones that we have would be ones like the P66, Papyrus 66 of the Gospel of John, or Papyrus 75, which has about half of Luke and half of John, and others are just extremely fragmentary, and they're all found in the sands of Egypt or in southern Palestine it, because of the climate issue. Mm -hmm. Papyrus won't survive right. in a damp climate. Are there any pre-Nicene uh, Church Father readings that use the Byzantine majority? Well, there are, because that's what the Bergen's catalog okay. really was. So it, so it, it went back The 86,000 quotations went all the way up to about the 5th or 6th century, okay. but the bulk of them actually were coming from the 4th uh, century and earlier. Okay. What, uh, you know, when, when we get into the Byzantine majority text discussion or just New Testament textual criticism, but especially Byzantine majority the subject of the Textus Receptus comes up. So if you can summarize, what's the relationship between the TR and the Byzantine majority text? Most people are familiar with the TR as being the Greek printed text that underlies either the King James Version or its predecessors, mm -hmm. whether it's the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, or even um, the Tyndall Bible. Mm -hmm. And... It's very close to the Byzantine, but not exactly, because some of the readings in the Textus Receptus actually come from a minority of Greek manuscripts, a very small minority in certain places, mm -hmm. and some even come from the Latin without right. any Greek support. With the, the, the whole Erasmus issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they raise some of these issues because Erasmus... Uh, uh, Jan Kranz uh, had written a book on Erasmus and Biza as conjectural critics because of certain mm -hmm. conjectures they made in their own printed editions of the Textus Receptus that had no Greek manuscript support. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking in terms of overall comparison, 
the Textus Receptus is probably about 98 and a half percent identical with the Byzantine text, mm -hmm. which is a closer relationship than say the Byzantine against the critical text or the T Textus Receptus against the critical text, where they are probably at about only a 94% agreement. Mm -hmm. It's still extremely high, yeah. which is why yeah. we have a reliable text in virtually all of these editions. The only question is in that last 6% between the critical text and the Byzantine or the last half one and a half percent between the TR and the Byzantine, which readings are more likely original. Mm -hmm. Now, would, you, would, would your uh, argument or your position be Okay, don't use the Alexandrian material. Don't do that reasoned eclecticism stuff. Use the Byzantine majority, or are you saying we should use all of this and give equal weight to the Byzantine majority? What? How would you articulate your no, position? No, the equal weight argument would be something like uh, what David Allen Black or Harry Sturrs would hold, where he they considered all three of the major text types, Byzantine, Western, and Alexandria, to basically be equal in authority, and then they would go with usually a majority, two out of three two majority of, three, of yeah. those. Uh, my position on the Byzantine text is to follow exclusively the Byzantine reading, mm -hmm. and I have various reasons for it. Some of them get complicated, but mm -hmm. uh, I follow primarily the Byzantine text uh, all the time, and I think we should be aware of what is in the Western text and what's in the Alexandrian text, which also means be aware of what's in the various other printed editions, whether mm -hmm. it's the critical text or even the Textus Receptus. Mm -hmm. We should know what they do read and why I would reject certain of their readings on the basis of my Byzantine priority position. Mm -hmm. Now, you brought up the name Bergen, and his, his name usually gets us, gets used, right or wrong, uh, by like King James only advocates. So w what's your position on that? How do you, how would you talk to someone if, if you're, if you don't, you know, side with the King James only crowd, how do you talk to someone in that camp, uh, to get them to think differently? Well, I obviously am not in the King James or the Textus Receptus only type mm -hmm. camp. And I consider it a mistake on their part, mainly because they don't seem to read Bergen for what he says, because Bergen clearly says he's not trying to establish the King James or the Textus Receptus as totally perfect. Mm -hmm. And in numerous places throughout his actual published works, he says here, this is where the TR is wrong. And if the TR is wrong at that point, then the King James would be wrong at that point as well. Mm -hmm. And he has very many readings that he cites where he clearly mm -hmm. states that he would not support the TR or King James at those points, although he says for public reading in churches, he did happen to prefer sure. the King James Version. Right. But for actual study, he would say, no, uh, there are places where it's wrong, and the current King James only and Textus Receptus only people seem to overlook that when mm -hmm. they try to elevate Bergen as one of their supporters. He mm -hmm. simply is not. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a, an example or two of where Byzantine majority emphasis helps, you know, resolve some issue? Like that what, what role might it play? That I'm just, this is random now. If these aren't good examples, don't, don't get distracted. <laughs> but like John chapter five, I believe it's around verse four. Right. You know, the, the uh, stirring of the waters. Um, does it help there, the, the ending of Mark problem? I mean, how would uh, the Byzantine majority approach really sort of resolve that mm. or be you know, equally coherent? If one is following a Byzantine priority approach, then all of these passages are part are of the present. Byzantine text. Mm -hmm. The ending of Mark, uh, the short ending, only appears, I mean, ending at 16.8, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, only appears in two old manuscripts. The UBS edition cites another 13th century manuscript, 304, but 304 actually has, as James Snap has demonstrated on his blog site, it has a commentary of Theophylact that just simply was not finished, and it breaks off at 16.8, mm -hmm. so it should not really even count. And on the John 5 passage, 
Yes, uh, the Alexandrian text, these earlier manuscripts do omit the angel stirring the pool, and the first one to go in would be healed of whatever disease he had, but the Byzantine manuscripts all have this, and there may have been reasons for omitting that, mm -hmm. and that might be something to do with, for example, Paul talked about the question of possibly illegitimate worship of angels. Mm -hmm. And so there could be considerations that are theological that would lead to the omission. And usually the commentaries that favor the Alexandrian text omitting at that point say the Byzantine added it because they were just adding in some local legend. But the, yeah. if they did that, then where are all these other local legends that aren't getting added in? And why did that one get added in? Well, the, the other thing that's curious about that is is later in the passage where there isn't a textual problem, the same, it's the same thing is referred to. Right. The yeah. stirring of the water. Which well, is a problem the uh, later on in uh, verse 7 of that chapter 5 of John, uh, Jesus says to him, do you want to be made well? And he says, I have no one to put me in when the water is stirred. Right, right. And if you leave the passage out, then that makes it doesn't no make sense, any sense at all. <laughs> Because if I were the reviser that had removed that passage, I didn't do a very good job. I would have gone to verse 7, and I would have said, do you want to be made well? And he said, yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. it, would right. be, it would have been an easy scribal revision, but sure. it never was made. There's no manuscripts that omit at, or change it at verse 7 at that point. Mm -hmm. let's, let's shift a little bit into some more contemporary things. Do you have an opinion, um, I'm not asking you for insider information, but do you have an opinion on, I guess it's probably been the last two or three years about supposedly a fragment you know, of the New Testament that goes back to the first century. You know, Dan Wallace has mentioned this, and I think Craig Evans mentioned it a couple times. Any opinion on that? I have an opinion that I'd like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with everybody uh, else. <laughs> every, we've been waiting for several years now for it to come out and there's been speculation that maybe it's part of the green collection at the museum of the bible and maybe they're going to announce oh, or publish a something big splash, but yeah. we don't even know if green has it dan wallace knows something but he's had to sign a non-disclosure right, agreement right. so we don't know what's going on with that and if the stories that have been told about it are correct, it was supposedly a fragment that was used as mummy cartonage in a mummy mask right. yeah. in Egypt. And apparently because of the date of the mummy, that's why they could determine that this was made in the uh, first century. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe correct, it may not, but until it's open for actual scholarly examination and scrutiny, we can't really say much of anything. Mm -hmm. I would love to have a first century fragment of Mark. But unless I see what happens, all I can say is right now we have no actual evidence. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, I don't know too much about it because my field is not New Testament textual criticism, but last year we talked to Peter Gurry mm -hmm. um, and his, again, new methodology or new, new means of classification or sorting out. I mean, what do you think uh, of some of the newer developments? Are they going to change the way scholars look at sort of the buckets? Are they going to change any of the buckets or is it something that's less uh, fundamental? This new method is called the CBGM mm -hmm. and it stands for Coherence-Based Genealogical Method, which is basically the creation of Gerd Mink over at Münster where they create the Nessel Allen text. And it's based on a computerized program that once you plug in the proper information you run it through the computer and it gives out a diagram of the textual flow of all the manuscripts at that point. And it does this for each individual variant reading at a different point within a given chapter or book. And the trouble is very few people understand it, mm -hmm. including myself. And the data, the program itself has not been made fully public, so okay. we have no way to really evaluate it. Now, Peter Gurry has actually worked with it. His dissertation was on that, and he's had access to it that other people have not had. Mm -hmm. And whatever he says is probably based on a lot more knowledge of it than mm -hmm. I have, but I am extremely skeptical of it. Are, and what are they trying to detect? Is it try, Are they trying to detect patterns in manuscript 
problems or scribal it's a part of copying a, mistakes it's a new or? method that it goes to some of the research that Klaus Wachtel has done where basically instead of having individual text types like mm-hmm. we've been talking about right. Alexandrian, Byzantine and Western the new concept is that there really is only one text and that variations within it flow in different directions. And then manuscripts tend to group and cluster together according to the way that textual flow went. But it's the idea of eliminating text types and trying to get back to the archetype manuscript, which they term in German the initial text, the Ausgangs text, mm-hmm. from which all other variant readings at a given point may have derived. Hmm. And it's a supposed improvement upon the traditional practice of textual criticism, which for most people is called reasoned eclecticism, where you are looking at external evidence and internal evidence and trying to get a balance between the two. And this CBGM works strictly with the external evidence. And then once the data comes out, then the researcher can then apply his own internal evidence to try to evaluate it. Yeah, I, I, I guess if Peter were here, I'd want to know what does flow mean? And what about the assumption that there is an, an or text or an Ausgang text? The, the flow is really just trying to say what reading was the mother of the readings that go in one direction or the mother of the readings that go in another direction. Uh, so it's actually making comparisons? So it's, trying, it's comparing all of the manuscripts to try to determine from computer which reading. Wow, which reading likely, produced all the other ones. And then yeah. they create a whole yeah. tree of descent of the manuscripts, saying that the manuscripts down at the bottom of the tree are the ones that are the furthest removed from that initial text, where the ones up to the top of the tree are the closest to the original text. Okay, I, I, you just made me a little more skeptical. <laughs> well, yeah, well, uh, I mean, I hope so much, so. so much for any intuition. I hope know. so because I'm skeptical myself. <laughs> so, all right, but may, if Peter listens to this, Peter will will have that conversation. I'm sure too. he will. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing. You know what you do. I, I, I we should alert people again who've had some Greek and are interested in this. Uh, where can they get copies of the Byzantine majority text? Uh, I've worked for Logos, so we have that in digital, of course, in the software. Right. But for people who like to handle books, where would they go? Well, digitally, first of all, it's available by almost all mm-hmm. software products. Yep. And BibleWorks has it. Logos mm-hmm. has it. Uh, Accordance has mm-hmm. it. And I'm, there's several of these others out there that have it. We released our Byzantine text in the public domain, so anybody right. can use right. it. But... Um, As far as the printed copies, the 2005 original printed copy, as far as I can tell, is totally out of print, and the only way to get it is online in a PDF. Mm -hmm. Is that that on the new website? It's on the new Byzantine website that Mm -hmm. is being posted over in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ulrich uh, Peterson Peterson is handling that, and I've been working with Ulrich Peterson, and his assistant is Daniel Mount, and Mm -hmm. Daniel Mount is putting together, in fact, a collection of my essays and published articles to be printed in the book eventually. Mm -hmm. But that new website has not only the volumes of the 2005 edition, it has a PDF of the Reader's Edition that came out in 2010. And the Reader's Edition has not only the Greek text, but has all the verbs parsed, and it has um, basic lexicon right. entries yeah, for vocab all of them. frequency, yeah. Uh, so all of that can be uh, obtained from the website. But in printed form, uh, right now, I think the reader's edition can still be had, maybe through Amazon. Mm-hmm. But it's being published in Germany, so that's the question. It, sure. And it's publishing on demand, I think. Mm-hmm. But I think you might be able to find it... Uh, on the internet Mm -hmm. and we are going to come out with a new edition of the Greek New Testament not the reader's edition but a new edition of the Greek New Testament in a paperback format that's about the same size as the United Bible Society's edition and that's being published in Germany as well it should come out sometime next year I hope early next year for for listeners uh, 
my website, you know, I blogged about the uh, new website and Ulrich, uh, Ulrich is someone I know because we've worked with him uh, mm -hmm. through Lagos and he gave me a heads up about that and asked me to post it, which we did. Uh, so listeners should be aware of that. Uh, you can go up to drmsh.com and just put in the word Byzantine and you're going to find it. So if you want access to that site, you could Google it. You could use that means, but you'll, you'll be able to find it and get the materials you want. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for spending some time with us. Glad to do it. Yeah, thanks. All right, Mike, those were four great interviews. I'm glad Hugh Ross cleared up the Pluto issue for <laughs> right. me. And uh, <laughs> it's no longer a dilemma. There you go. You heard it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and other than those four interviews, Mike, we've attended a couple of papers. What did you think about the last couple that we uh, went to about technology and nanotech? And yeah, it was a bioethics section. And the first paper was on uh, sort of the ethics of creating uh, chimeras. And then there was one uh, that sort of focused a little bit more on synthetic biology, uh, you know, it, new advances in you know genetic technology and whatnot. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I, I you know, I thought the Q and A for both of those was actually more interesting than the paper. Uh, it's interesting to hear people interact with what the speaker said, because uh, you know, I I was a little bit familiar, probably more with the. Uh, the chimera, the transhumanist one, and the other one. But, you know, when people sort of probe what the speaker's saying with questions, uh, it, it, it's just more helpful. I think actually for the synthetic biology one, the way it ended uh, about, hey, you know, is there really a difference if, if we can build life from the ground up? Uh, is that really life or human life or, you know, creation life? Or can we even use a word of creation? about it should we use something else maybe building or making or something like that well that that's what i was hoping the whole paper would be but since it ended that way you know, we had some good discussion afterwards so i think you know i, I can say i'm glad that we went to both uh, learned a few things and of course got exposed to some some scholars working in these areas that we consider important stay tuned for part two and uh, i want to thank everybody for listening to the naked bible podcast god bless Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.